Excellent. Uh, you mentioned uh, balance, uh, Danny. Uh, actually, talk about balance and, and, and why it's important to have a runner balance just in a standing position before they even go out and run at all. One of the things you're going to uh, think about real quickly when we're talking about the, the foot, the, as we raised the heel of, of common running shoes, as the heel got higher, note what had to happen. You guys know what happened. The rear foot is the great adapter for all terrain. Thus, it's very mobile and adaptive when it's in front of your body mass. That's what it does. It does two things, break and adapt. So when we raised the heel and made people heel strike, we had to start controlling rear foot pronation, okay? And supination of the rear foot is a little more rare, but more commonly uh, pronation of the rear foot. Guess what? When you land under your mass, your midfoot's locked, your rear foot's locked out, your rear foot is stable. So if the heel is in front of the body, it's a loose adapter. Thus, they had to start building control parts to running shoes because it forced you, the high heel forced you to, to heel strike. Thus, you have a loose adapter, thus we have to control it. So we started to chase everything. And then it went to the PTs. We have fasciitis, well, you got a loose, well, I got patellar tendonitis. Loose adaptation, right, and pronation starting at the rear foot. And it's magnified as you come over center. And then if you have any late stage pronation or forefoot biomechanical abnormalities, then it's even exacerbated more. So the ankle will adapt to all terrain, even for what your forefoot position is. But if you land in a midfoot strike underneath your mass, there's hardly any time for impact forces or braking forces ro or rotational forces. So you put yourself in a more injury preventative uh, stance. Now, a lot of people are gonna argue, you know, from the 70s to now, how many injuries occur back then and, how, and now. You know, that's kind of irrelevant. If I can tell you the physics and the physiology of landing in a better position, you can figure it out for yourself. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, no, no, the balance, the balance, right? So the balance, if, if again, like I kind of started out the conversation, if I put something underneath uh, your foot, any position of your foot, now MBT has come out with, you know, a high midfoot. Well, it does center you over your mass. The good thing about that is, you know, it's, it's a little unstable, so you'll fire and restabilize. I think it's kind of like what we found with uh, stroke victims. They used to give you a walker and a very stiff shoe, and there you were. You walked like a robot because you didn't have that mobility. You didn't refire and retrain your, your proprioception, your nerves to fire the muscles correctly. Now I think you guys put people on a wobble board, and they, they give them un, un, you know, non-stability ground contact that helps you to rebalance. So it's the same thing with the foot, you know? Anytime you bend and deform a shoe, you waste energy. So you guys, you know, if you're putting people in a very clunky, stiff, over-controlled shoe, not only are your feet weakened, but you have to use all this strong propulsive mus muscle to bend the shoe. Now you flex, to flex the shoe, now you strain your fascia. So there's many, many reasons we have injury. Um, so you can have a shoe that has a little more flexibility. All the things we're talking about was, I'll just one Newton plug here, is that we, we spent 15 years learning what you guys are talking about. You know, Jennifer and I built orthotics for 25 years. We found it was, most, most people were just getting this breaking and rotational, and Paulo and I started teaching people to get more midfoot and forefoot. That helped, but the heel gets in the way. The heel gets in the way of, of humans' balance, Thus, you start in an altered position, you'll land in an altered position, you start in a neutral position with no influence about the heel height, you'll, you'll start to run in a more neutral position. And it's all about, you know, we talk about, you know, a lot of discussions now are because of Chris McDougall, you know, hating all the run, run shoe companies and ba basically blaming them for his injuries. <laughs> he should blame himself, but, you know, because you have to learn, um, you know, it's, you know, Shoes don't injure people, people injure themselves. Uh, there is an influence from the ground uh, up. And I, you know, Danny and I talk about whole body running. We're running with our whole body, but the influence of what the ground contact is and the lack of is what injures us. So you guys are getting educated today about, you know, afferent feedback, this ability to get sensory input from the ground. You know, there's, there's 200,000 sensors going on in your feet. We, we were doing a little thing yesterday. You could feel every little blade of grass if you concentrate when you're barefoot. 
you know, Newton's about the most, you know, effective tool for that because you feel those lugs and we have a biomechanical top plate. That firm plate is right next to those sensors, thus you can feel more. And so you'll self-regulate your impact much better than if you were in a foam medium that blanks all that out. Thus, you hear small people or large people hitting the ground in foam shoes really loudly. I mean, with a really loud impact. They can't feel the ground, thus they hit hard. You hit hard, thus you have to push hard. So those two things create the impact, injuries, and then the propulsive strain of trying to keep pace. Well, I, I'm sure I messed that, that one up, close, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, through the years, uh, as shoes got higher or more foamy, I mean, there was this notion at retail that, that customers wanted this uh, step in comfort. And, and maybe, maybe the retailers were at liberty of what the shoes were coming to them. And I mean, the, the customers saying, oh, I want that, it's soft, and I'll walk around the store and it's soft. That doesn't necessarily help you become a better runner or a more efficient runner. I, I guess from the point of view, and not to harp on, on previous shoe design, but, but uh, Jay, talk about your study briefly about um, the shoeing forces in, 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 uh, in, in wearing high-heeled high running shoes and kind of the impacts of that. So uh, with co-author, we published a study at EVA, which um, Took, took a little bit deeper look at some of the things that actually happened. So um, plain and simple, anytime you shorten uh, your stride rate, you're going to have uh, forces go down, okay? Um, it's pretty simple to sort of think about that, um, and it tends to hold up under, under scrutiny. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen with a number of studies uh, is that, you know, when you run barefoot, you tend to take shorter strides, uh, and that's so you'd expect forces to go down, okay? Um, and uh, what we found was is that if you look at a statistical analysis, and we have people doing stats who are way smarter than I am, uh, they can tell you that if you look at the percent uh, decrease that we saw in stride length and the percent decrease that we see um, in, in, in I mean, percent increase we see in cadence, it doesn't explain the really large changes that we actually see uh, in, in, in joint forces. So we actually saw what we call joint torques, where we think about twisting forces that occur in the limbs. And so um, while we saw a stride length decrease about you know, uh, 7 to 9%, uh, basically we saw changes on the magnitude of 34% uh, at various forces of the knee or knee, uh, forces trying to drive uh, the knee to the inside. Uh, we saw basically 38% uh, uh, in changes um, that, that occur in, in the uh, the sagittal plane force of the knee, your try force is trying to basically kind of trying to bend the knee, uh, and we saw 52% uh, uh, changes uh, up at the hip um, in, in rotational forces that occur at the hip. So it's interesting if you start to think about you know the implications of that. Um, again, not saying shoes are bad, and we and I'll, I'll point out. For, you know, to be true, we don't know where the threshold is. I don't know if a 6% increase or decrease is going to be you know, pathologic that's going to cause an injury. We don't know. We don't know if it takes 24%. I have no idea. But I think it's suffice to say things are sort of shifting in the wrong direction. Okay? Um, you know, if you look at some of the research out there, you look at, okay, well, what caused a lot of you know, uh, lower limb uh, type injuries? What causes a lot of patellar femoral injuries and IT band injuries? Now all stem from you know, rotational uh, stabilization problems up at the hip. So if, if I run in a certain piece of apparatus, whether it's whatever, okay, on my foot, which increases the demand at my hip, that's probably not a good direction to go into. Uh, if I'm, you know, somebody with chronic patellofemoral problems, um, avoiding kind of compressive forces of patella in the, the femur is probably a good idea. So again, there, there's some interesting things that sort of make sense when you start to think about, you know, um, you look at the joint forces that, that we see running, running barefoot, we see some pretty big changes. And, and I'll be, again, full honest, we don't know exactly where those changes are coming from. I think that if you look at, um, you know, again, the stride length, doesn't really explain the difference that we see. Um, you know, the fact that you just shorten your stride doesn't explain that whole difference. And I think a lot of it has to do with this kind of thing, which I personally don't know how to quantify, which is you know the idea behind intrinsic muscle stiffness or how you sort of prepare the limb. I think there's probably a good window for kind of you know um, somebody talked earlier about you know the stiffness of the limb. You want to be stiff enough, but not too stiff. Um, and, and I think that you know possibly some magic combination of, of, uh, of, of, you know, cushioning exists, which may be even better than barefoot. I, I don't really know. I mean, I, th I think it's interesting. I think part of the things that, you know, one of the things that interests me in our field is to sort of look at this stuff and see kind of how it plays out over the next uh, few years. So.